Good afternoon and welcome to the Toronto International Film Festival. My name is Aida Sarza and I'm a member of the programming team here at, at TIFF. I am very pleased to introduce today the film Rojo by Argentinian director Benjamin Neistat. To begin, we would like to acknowledge that this event is taking place on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of New Credit and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Ishinabe and the Huron-Wendat. We are very pleased and very grateful to have the opportunity to work in this community. This film is eligible for the Toronto Platform Prize presented by Air France. Rojo is also eligible for the Gross People's Choice Award. Please vote for your favorite films at tiff.net slash vote. We would like to thank Luxbox for providing us with this film and thank you also to Ika for their generous support. Benjamin Neistat was born in Buenos Aires. He studied at the Universidad del Cine in that city and was recently a fellow at Harvard's Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. He made his directorial debut with the short film El Juego in 2010, followed by Historia del Mal in 2011. His feature films as writer-director are History of Fear, The Movement, and Rojo. We invite you all to stay in the room after the credits roll for a question and answer session with the filmmaker. Uh, but now, please to introduce Rojo, allow me to welcome Benjamin Neistat. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. How are you? How are you doing? Uh, we're very happy to be here. Uh, we have to thank the TIFF staff, which has been very kind to us. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, one of the magnificent actors from the movie, the great Alfredo Castro, who is here present from Chile. Hello, thanks. Thank you. I'm He's very happy being here, accompanying Benjamin in his second film. And I think it's a very clever, sensitive film. And we share the, the, some horrible story of our dictatorships in our countries. So um, I'm very pleased being here. Thank you very much for coming. So on my end, I don't like to speak very much before the screening so that you enter the film uh, as uh, fresh as you can, but I'll be happy to uh, discuss and do some uh, Q&A afterwards if you like to stay. So thanks again and enjoy as much as you can. Thank you. Thank you very much. The, the different, the questions related to the different kind of humanities, you mean? You've character, right? Him finding himself and realizing he's done something else. Exactly. Uh, the, it's a very complex leading, leading character and uh, uh, the questions related to the different kinds of humanities that we see in this complex character um, um, played by Dario Grandinetti. And the second one is related to the visual aesthetics of the film. Sometimes very uh, rich and, and vibrant uh, image and sometimes uses some blurred images. Thank you. Uh, okay, difficult questions. Uh, question number one, uh, I think, uh, as you say, uh, I would agree that there's different characters with different psychological backgrounds. Then again, I think it's quite a tight world, that of the movie, because everybody's so miserable. Uh, nobody's actually, you know, a, a moral human being. They're all just trying to get away with different things. And I wanted to create a world like that because I think that's pretty much what happened in my country through the through the 70s in, in, in a large extent of the society, just people thinking individually and, you know, looking elsewhere while a lot of things were going on. Um, as for your second question, what you describe as blur or, or um, you're probably talking about the fact that this movie in trend, intends to uh, not only talk about the 70s, but reflect the filmmaking of the 70s, of which I'm a, a very big fan. So uh, we used optics from the 70s, old Panavision lenses. Also, we added layers of grain uh, in the digital image. And we worked a lot with the DOP, the great uh, Pedro Sotero is a Brazilian DOP, to get a 70s look straight, which is probably less um, sharp and clean than the movies that you see nowadays. There's a question in the back. Thank you. Since the counselor did nothing wrong, why did he feel that he had to take uh, the investigator out to the desert? 
through the, the uh, that's a good question, I, through the script writing process, I thought a lot about that. There were versions in which uh, he was more explicitly, you know, he was killing the guy, shooting himself, the, the, the other strange person, the other strange man. Uh, but I think it's, it's, he hides the body because he can, and he just wants to avoid the whole hassle of having to explain and being him suspected in a time, in a particular time in which, you know, things could link into darker areas uh, and problems. And he just, he knows that he will get away and he just does it. Uh, it's, it's a bit arbitrary on the script. And again, I think it, as I said earlier, reflects a certain state of things through the decade. Question in the back. Thank you. Why is the main character wearing a wig at the very end? Uh, that, uh, that's also uh, something that came up uh, very uh, late in the, just about when we went, were starting to shoot. The, the wig is awful and, and I, I, I did a, a lot of research on, on, you know, taking looks at pictures and, and footage from the time and I thought the, the looks were sometimes uh, monsterish, uh, you know, the makeup and all. And, I, and, I, and a, a lot of men used to use very notorious wigs as if, you know, they didn't care that you absolutely realized it was a wig. So I thought at that point in the movie where he just, you know, just has been freed and he's coming up and uh, that he's a murderer and everybody's aware of that, that he would feel comfortable enough to put a wig, you know, and, and, and the looks in the particular final sequence of the theater are particularly pushed into a, a monsterish, you know, the makeup in the women and the, the people, they're starting to look worse as the, as the movie comes to an end, yeah. Thank you. Talk a little bit about the sub theme of young people um, uh, along the story. At times hopeful, but very little, essentially hopeless. Yeah, uh, probably you felt hopeful because the dance is beautiful to look at. Then again, it's very naive. Uh, it's, a, it's a dance. I mean, it's a, sort of a, a, an old opera. They're starting to rehearse and and. Uh, you know, they, they're they part of these layers of complicity with, with a broader moral uh, trauma that is starting in the in the country. So they couldn't be uh, different from their parents and from the rest of, of the people. And the dance is maybe there to emphasize the naive side of, of this community, which is, you know, dancing and, you know, going to see a show while people are disappearing in front of their eyes. Yeah, I guess. Question there, thanks. Yes. Of course, yeah, that's a very good question. I think first, uh, you know, th there is a large tradition of making films about the 70s in Argentina. So my film is only one among a, a group of films that have been existing for years now. Uh, to to my opinion, I mean, we have seen a lot of films in which uh, there is an approach uh, where, you know, good and evil are portrayed in a, maybe in a man manichaistic approach or, or, you know, in a simpler, Output, but I thought that the moral journey of the spectator would be richer if this character is just strange, not a particular hero or a model or an idealist, as many of, as you very well say, many of the people who were disappeared were, but just someone harder to find out. But then again, he is murdered and disappeared, and that's uh, out of the question. So I, I thought it's a clear-cut case anyway. It doesn't matter that he's... Uh, 
you know, he's a strange or that he yells to the people, that doesn't matter. Because I think that would create a richer debate or a richer discussion in the, as I said, in the tradition of all the films that have been made about the, the period. Thank you. Question. What's the meaning of the title, title Rojo, which means red in English? And does it have to do with the eclipse or how? Why, why is the title like that? Yeah, I, like, I always get asked about the meaning of, of things and I, I say an answer, but uh, then sometimes I, I'm, I'm lying a little bit because it's not like I know what everything means in there. Uh, that's part of the, the curious thing about uh, making films. But then again, of course, it's linked to the eclipse, but it's also linked to the fact that there was a hysteria. I mean, this was during the context of the Cold War, so there was a hysteria about communism, and there was a fear of, uh, you know, of uh, left movements, which are usually identified with the color red, and uh, it was even a color w which was, you know, uh, not to be worn, and so on. Uh, so there's a, a number of layers about. There's also, it's also linked to blood, and so so it sort of uh, synthesizes a lot of elements in the in the film. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the, this, the um, Probably the final scene in the in the desert, where the character of Alfredo Castro talks about has this religious discourse at some point about God before going back to Buenos Aires. Why did you make that decision? Yeah, uh, the, the, there is a religious side to him because there was a great degree of complicity with, of the Catholic Church and the perpetrators of a, of a genocide that was uh, starting to take place in Argentina. So it it would be very you know likable that. He would be a religious person, even though he uses some, some in some strange way Christianity to justify the most awful deeds. And then you ask why he's going back, and because as he pretty much tells him uh, textually that he sort of forgives the man because he thinks he has acted in the in the right way in the eyes of God, who wants to cleanse the society. That would be the speech of the of the people who were in charge at the time. So he pretty much uh, is a vehicle for 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 that, yeah. Thank you. There's a lot of symbolism in the movie, but especially why why showing the eclipse? And uh, when the, the character goes to the woods, there is someone who's watching the eclipse and, and watching her through um, a welder's mask. Why? Why is that? Yeah, as you say, since since it's kind of a, it's not per se a genre movie, but it's sort of genre. It's sort of a thriller, and in genre in genre you have a, a symbolic approach to filmmaking. Uh, so there's, as you say, a lot of symbols. In that, uh, in that matter, the eclipse serves, you know, I show the attitude of the people during the eclipse. First, they seem to be interested in it. Then they start playing football and they just ignore the thing. There's even a guy telling the main character to look away, not to pay attention, and it's a red eclipse. So there's a whole layer of, of symbols playing there. Uh, about the guy with the welding mask, uh, I did some research on, on eclipse and there's... It turns out there's people who are fanatics of eclipses. I, I, I went, even went to a meeting of, uh, with them and they showed me pictures of how they gather to watch eclipses and they use welding masks. And it's it's pretty uh, scary to, you know, when you find someone in the middle of nowhere with a... So I thought it would be like a nice uh, little, even though it doesn't follow through afterward. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Uh, 
Oh, yeah. Know. Why is the detective Chilean? Uh, does that would that mean anything to an Argentinian audience in particular that we're missing out here in North America? Yeah, uh, maybe some people can be unaware of it, but I think uh, the at the time in the 70s, the U.S. was financing a plan by uh, by the CIA, which was called the Condor Plan, which was uh, money to put together all the militaries of the Latin America in order to chase across countries militants from left organizations that would cross to different countries. Uh, so it would make sense that there was a Chilean element uh, doing that kind of thing in Argentina. It's uh, it's likable. That, that actually happened a lot, yeah. Thank you. Gracias. The music is very intentional throughout the film. How did you, um, why did you choose this? Um, how did you, how was the process process of choosing the moving in, in the, uh, the I, music in the film? We worked with a very good uh, Dutch co film composer, very experienced, and we pretty much tried to imitate the certain scores uh, of films that we really liked from the 70s, like the film Conversation by Francis Ford Coppola, and some of the music from Taxi Driver in terms of arrangement instruments and how we use it in the film. So it's part of uh, our intention to get into a 70s film grammatic. Maybe some people relate to that, yeah. Are there any questions in the back? Yes. Does the action take place at the very end of Isabel? Uh, yes, you are. Peron's government. You are very informed, as I see. In in late 1975, uh, there was still no uh, military coup, but the the very last part of a so-called democracy with uh, Peron's wife. Peron had died uh, in 74, and his uh, wife uh, was in charge, but in reality already a number of provinces were intervened and occupied by military forces. So it was sort of a transition to horror. Not many films deal with this time because it's, it, it means a lot of controversy to speak about that, that particular part of the, uh, that 75 year. But I thought it was important to set the movie there. Actually, uh, my, my, my fam I come from a family that was uh, part of a, a revolutionary political party and their house was burned in 1975. So I thought it was pertinent to work within that year. I have a question for you. Yeah. How do you think the, the film will be... Um, received in Argentina, because there's a lot of, um, uh, there are many films as uh, we have talked about uh, ar around the, the years of the dictatorship uh, of filmmakers of the new contemporary Argentinian cinema. But this one in particular, of this particular years before it started and and uh, using this aesthetics and, and um, just overall, how do you think Rojo is gonna be? Received in yeah, so far we home. haven't screened it there. We're opening uh, in October. Uh, really looking forward to that. I, I hope it creates some uh, dialogue, some debate. You know, to we are we have a very bad situation over there right now, uh, particularly in the economics, but also on the on the political side. Uh, there is a, a president which is from a, I would call a far right government and. He has called that the, the human rights uh, policies, uh, which were sort of uh, policies of all the governments from 1983 to now, the, he has called that to be a, a heist, like like something that uh, is money throwing or, or unnecessary. So it's more than ever important to do films about the 70s because the new, newer generations don't have, you know, the, the the experience of hearing about these things so much as maybe my generation. I was born in the 80s, so. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about the man with the gun in the locker room? Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, it, it's really, it was a time of, in which a lot of people were armed because of the context. It would be common to be armed uh, 
and it, it made sense to put someone with a gun, you know, just cleaning his gun in the locker room. And it was fun at the time in which the lawyer is starting to get more and more alienated to just put a shoot there, you know, just to, to wake up who's sleeping in the theater also. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank you. There's actually no, it seems that there's no resolution in how the, the crime uh, investigation was solved. How did the, the investigator dealt with the person who actually brought him in to, to yeah. solve this case? That's in Rojo part two. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully next year. Huh? Yeah. Are there any other no, questions? No, actually, I mean, it, I, to my, of course, there are ties, uh, loose ends in the script, uh, but I think it has to do with an overall complicity. Like the guy who hired him, he just did it because of his wife who was alienated. He didn't mind so much about, I think maybe he knows and doesn't care. Maybe, you know, it, they won't follow through. It was a time of, you know, just letting things be. People didn't want to ask the wrong questions or get into the wrong places. Everybody was looking after what they had and, you know, keeping to themselves. Yeah, that, that would be the right answer. Yeah. Thank you. The commercial of the man eating the candy and then pointing with the gun, it looked like it was really from the time. Was it? Uh, and why did you use it? Sure, that's a commercial from uh, 1974, so it is absolutely from the time. I think it's shocking. I think it's it's amazing, and it gives gives us you know a clear look into what uh, the naturalization of violence what was at the time. Naturalization of guns, of selfishness. Uh, I think it's a, it's a clear portrait of what the movie is trying to deal with. Also, it's sort of a breather in the middle of the plot. You know, to maybe have a laugh and just keep going to the end. Yeah. questions I think okay. we thank you so much for Thanks being here today Thanks for staying. thank you to Benjamin yeah. Neistat Thanks Gracias <laughs>